Greetings, everybody, and welcome to Elephant TV. Uh, my name is Joe Kubuthi. Uh, today, I'll be speaking to Nanjira Sambuli. Uh, Nanjira is a writer, a researcher, uh, who's been mainly involved within the tech and governance spaces. Uh, Karibu Nanjira to the elephant. Asante sana. Great. I mean, just to, I just want to just get this conversation going. I mean, in very many ways, uh, COVID-19, I mean, it's now the cliche that it's, it's changed the world and now we're living the new normal. But I mean, but in your view, how has, how has, how has COVID-19 influenced and affected uh, the digital space? You know, its use, its growth, its limitations, particularly from a human, a human standpoint. Mm. Well, the most interesting thing, and particularly for like developing countries is if the internet and whether it's the infrastructure investment or having the right kind of legislative environment in place, those conversations at the time were being thought as 2025 plans, they were fast tracked to 2020. Right. You know? mm -hmm. um, because at, the, at this point, if you're telling people not to go to work, not to go to school, they had to stay at home and they have to keep working, they have to keep moving. It had to bring to bear for many governments the question of, can people do that? Here in Kenya, we saw, for example, how the government as one of the early responses to the pandemic was to partner with uh, Loon, which is part of Alphabet or more famously Google, to try and bring another way of connectivity in Mashinani, right? Mm. Um, which is really interesting. Um, so a lot of that has happened where everybody had to be like, okay, we are going to have to make this jump. Even if it was part of the plan, it was fast tracked in terms of timelines. Right. And it also became a litmus test of what's already there, what's hope, what's hype in terms of all the stuff that's been happening the last couple of years. If say Kenya says 80% uh, of its population is connected to the internet, it's been a litmus test of what kind of connectivity they have. Um, whether that is at home or in school or in matatus, you know. Mm. Um, so it's been a really interesting point to see when we go beyond the surface of statistics, what it actually whistles down to. Uh, and so it's been really a litmus test of what we're doing uh, when we, we have these hype cycles around what tech can do and the internet. Uh, but now it's also cementing now that we're in 2021. And I think it's, it's creating a new dimension i don't like the new normal stuff too right it's creating a new dimension to how we'll be doing stuff even as we go back to to outside you know so we're going mm. back outside but we're taking the internet uh, and technologies with us with as the, much uh, right i mean that's interesting because um uh nangela nyabola in her book digital democracy which talks about uh, digital inequalities which, which you're actually talking about that COVID 19 mm. has really exposed these digital inequalities you know previously we were well, we're throwing this, this good numbers as we like doing, but mm. COVID has really exposed that, talking about access, infrastructure, but which, which, which brings to the fore a very new kind of inequality. You know, this is digital divide. Uh, uh, Paul Goldsmith for, for Peace for the Elephant talks about that the next frontier of, of haves and have nots is gonna be created between, between in a digital divide. So, I mean, in particularly in a Kenyan context, how, how will that play out? Mm -hmm. Uh, seeing that uh, the previous divide, apart from just rich and wealthy, has been also ethnicity, class, racism. So how does now tech play out within these new pre-existing inequalities? It, in short, tech will amplify the inequality that's there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, technologies are only going to serve whatever exists there. It's not necessarily going to bypass. You might have a minor adjustment to make things better, but normally that's not the case because again, technologies are not neutral. They're designed by the same structures that create classes, races, mm -hmm. tribalist um, elements to it. And it's very strongly linked, for example, to a Kenyan context to development plans. Um, Till today, so the joke is not even a joke anymore, it's still a truism that Kenya exists along the highway, as I think it's uh, Ndi who has said this. The, right? the Lunatic Express. Mm. The lunat and the roads, that, and the, whatever the road networks are today, any mm. infrastructure development, even the internet, the fiber optic cables and all the stuff that gets us follows the same path. Right. Electricity, where we have electricity is where we're more likely to get internet because none of these things, the internet is just going to jumpstart that. So the digital divide and, and digital inequalities are multifaceted. Right. There's one angle of the have and the have nots in the sense of who's connected and who isn't. And that mm -hmm. still exists in Kenya today. So by this, I mean, 
uh, people who still don't have access to say an internet enabled smartphone, right? Right. Um, those of us who do. Um, uh, that takes its own dynamics. It tends to be people in rural areas or urban poor communities. Uh, it takes a gendered perspective. It means if a woman earns less, she's less likely to be able to afford a mobile phone. And especially she's a provider and has to think about the kids and food, food versus phone is a different thing, you know? So that's just one angle between the have and have nots. But even among us who are connected, those of us who can comfortably get onto Zoom and have this interview and those who cannot because affording the bundles or the kind of connection that allows my, that unlimited access is another barrier. Right. Uh, increasingly as tech is advancing and we're getting more caught up, there's also everything from how the, the particular phone or laptop or tool you're using is designed. If it's designed, to, to let any advertiser sort of see everything you download and um, get access to. We are advancing towards another kind of divide between those who can pay for their privacy or their data to not be collected any which way. Mm -hmm. And those who can pay your way out basically. So I, a, a technical example would be like, I can, if, if Facebook, which is popular, offered a way out, a paid way out to not have ads bombarded when you whisper a conversation here, then suddenly you look on your phone and you get ads. We're starting to see that dimension. Um, I think in Kenya, particularly how we're just inundated by SMSs any which way, or, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting to start seeing how that will go even as we get more connected. So the long and short of it is that the digital divides are multifaceted. They will follow particularly any divides that are in society. And that's a good way to analyze progress because it's not just enough to say we've rolled out mm -hmm. our connectivity. In Kenya, in terms of coverage, I think we are almost at 80%, which means 80% of Kenya's landmass has some form of connectivity. Right. Um, reached. But that does not translate to 80% of the population being connected. And mm -hmm. even if it did, it does not translate to everybody connecting in a safe, in a meaningful, um, uh, affordable way that enriches their lives and enables them to do the stuff that we, we are taking for granted that you and I are able to do. Like, right. Have this conversation. Great. I mean, so just tied, tied within the conversation about digital divide. Uh, I mean, in, in particularly countries where this tech is originally from, we you seen that the rise of a new poly, a new elite, you know, tech elites, you know, if you may, when you're seeing it with, but in Silicon Valley, uh, in Europe. But in, the interesting thing is because in, in Africa, I mean, our elites are in more or less are manufactured by, by the colonial state. So, and so, what what does tech portend as a as a threat, but also as an opportunity to these elites? Will will many people are asking? Will will is tech is tech the, the end of the African political class, or will they find a way of re re rethinking their way into it? You know, the, and this new uh, new platform society that we're now moving into towards. I've never been a fan of these things being dichotomies, and that's what's really interesting about tech. Right, people want to create narratives that, whether it's a particular technology or right. we're just speaking about technology more broadly, it's the thing. And we've seen that mm. cycle of hype right. um, that causes us to miss out on so many things. Mm -hmm. You can argue on one hand that the elites, if you want to call them that, remain even more amplified. If you look at people who have the most following on these platforms, they tend to be the same people who are popular offline. Precisely. Is, for example, politicians are the same. All right, a few have made their names through being, you know, because of this particular moment and they've leveraged these tools. It's not necessarily uh, the, a cycle that can be repeated because also these platforms change all the time. Right. So today, right. Uh, if I'm trying to make it, I am, I've just logged onto a platform like Facebook or Twitter and I'm trying to set myself up with whatever kind of political views, it's not the same as if it was 10 years ago to get exposure, to be seen and people to resonate with your stuff. You probably have to venture into very dramatic mm. actions, right? Absolutely. So it does not necessarily, again, it does, tech does not necessarily, I think we, it's interesting we want to believe that it can, but tech again will always follow whatever the cycles of society are. And it will it'll mostly be in service to that. Uh, in our context, I mean, in our African context, it will tie to the fact that uh, our populations are getting younger. That means at some point, the divide between whoever is a political elite today in terms of age and the one who will be more, can resonate more with a younger person 
is going to vary. They'll have their own uh, elites, or if you will, however we define political elites. They're probably going to be a generation that has grown up or around a device, or at least their consumption patterns on information and how their political views have been formed will have something between a mobile phone, radio, internet, TV, right? As right. Mm -hmm. So that's more importantly what I'd be interested in. What's the political formation of mm -hmm. young Africa when all these tools are there? We joke about how the rest of us had, are unlearning our history from our Malki F. Singh textbooks, for example. Precisely. Um, how all these conversations we've been having, the blogs we've been writing, the interviews we've been doing, going to create a new archive that's mostly digital to help somebody who wants to understand what's the Kenyan political cycle be, as we're heading into 2022. Where do they go today on the internet? And purely on the internet to find out about this. What are the kinds of political thoughts that they then generate of their own based on the fact that there's more information. Is, is more information necessarily going to be what makes for a better political class or a different political class? I think those are the more important questions and right. actually very interesting ones that we have not really started uh, venturing into. Uh, and especially for uh, Kenyans who are political animals per se, we, 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 we've, 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 start, we've been missing the forest for the trees a bit too much. Mm, excellent. Uh, speaking of political class, I mean, uh, recently uh, Uganda just came out of an elections, and uh, twice, twice, 20, 2016 and uh, now 2021, uh, uh, the incumbent uh, President Yaguta Yuri Museveni has shut down the internet uh, mm -hmm. twice, uh, just days to the elections, and then uh, went back on three weeks, I think three, three weeks after the elections. Uh, what's the significance of 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 this kind of you know this kind of I don't call it mm. behavior this kind of behavior to 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 other states around but even just also to the citizenry who who today no longer just rely on the internet for information entertainment but increasingly is becoming a, a source of livelihood for very many for very many young uh, Africans what what's, what are the implications of this moving forward and what does it mean for you know, for, for states, but also for fascism, for, for new kinds of fascism across, across the region. Uganda has been a very instructive case in learning that, again, even technologies are political and politicized. Mm. There are tools of control, much right. like any other type of control that anyone in power would have. Right. The thing that's really interesting about Uganda is that the politics then uh, and the technology are such that one, one is in, uh, it's not necessarily changing the other. The fact that yes, even their own economy is getting more digitized has not stopped the fact that an order can be made and the internet is shut down and it's shut down for everyone. Right. What was particularly interesting about this 2021 incident is I believe that uh, uh, President Museveni then went on TV yeah. to make a press, uh, press statement apologizing for having to switch up the internet, but he had, it's like a, Sorry about this, guys. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. But but it had sorry. to happen. <laughs> sorry, not sorry, basically. Yeah. But mm -hmm. there's also another dimension to it to show you the different layers of control. Right. He based on an act action by Facebook, where Facebook had decided to deplatform um, and take off some of, yes. officials and yes. um, so officials both in government and affiliated with the party. So they mm -hmm. used the same playbook they had in the US with President Trump. Right. And they applied it to a country where they are not registered. Um, as a company and not beholden to the country's laws. They just, they, I think they, Facebook said they, based on reports, they decided to deplatform. These conversations are now starting to happen. If a technology we're using and relying upon for communication is based somewhere so far uh, out of our time zone, for example, mm -hmm. waking up one day and deciding to switch off these people's accounts. That gave the president a, a weaponry to say, you see, you cannot have foreigners coming in and interfering with our affairs. Now, mm. every African despot loves that, having that excuse in, ready. So this mm. one was handed a bit easily to them. So that's another dimension to the, the power aspects that come with these. Uh, so in an African and a Ugandan, as an, as an example, way to look at it, uh, we are headed into a situation where whose laws apply on the technologies in a particular jurisdiction? Whose laws apply to technology use in Kenya or Uganda? Mm -hmm. And that's just, let's say, laws we have on the land. But whose politics shape who gets access, who doesn't? When internet is switched off or isn't? 
You know, if you were comparing with Kenya, for instance, I don't imagine that somebody hasn't fantasized with the, the switch on and off button. The thing is, I think maybe chance or happenings that as the internet was rolled out more, there wasn't too much of an eye there, too much relies on it to do the same thing and for it to work. Correct. So other forms of control, then you look for other forms of control. What happens? You over bombard people with information. Look at our information diet around our politics right now. Right. It's its own kind of shutdown. Mm. It's its own kind of shutdown because right now, if I go on any of my platforms and just look for one news item about Lake Baringo, I will find out more about what the Senator of Baringo has said as opposed to why those lakes have been rising, right? Mm -hmm. Or what are the efforts that have been taken to actually address that? Um, so there are different ways of control that not necessarily until I'm on and off switch the way we've seen it in Uganda, mm -hmm. but sometimes you just bombard people with such bad, it's like, fast food, right? informational, intellectual, political fast food, that people are living on an unsteady diet and a very unhealthy mm -hmm. diet, um, but they still have access. So those are the nuances towards these notions of what Uganda is showing us. Um, so Uganda's is just the more on and off version of it. Um, here in Kenya, I would argue we have that kind of version where the internet is on, sure, but it's a very unhealthy one. Okay, which is which is actually you've pretty much my next question, which is actually you know, to ask you what are the forms of you know the digital fascism that 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 are taking shape, and you know, like how do we need to be more vigilant? Which, which and you already uh, began the conversation talking about this unhealthy diet of you know just uh, crass information, bomb you know bomb down to the populace. But what what other forms have you, have you seen and do you see taking shape? Because I think this is and and how do we need to start being vigilant, which I think is a is a more important mm -hmm. question around yeah. these new forms of uh, autocracy, despotism, and, and fascism that are taking place to, to manufacture consent to, 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 a very, to, a, to, a, to a very unhealthy status quo. Mm. Well, for one, what, whatever labels are placed on them are less important, again. Mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I would just purely academically contend whether fascism would be the applicable for Yeah, precisely. Exactly, exactly. But, Mm. The idea being, what should we be looking out for? Right. Uh, you know, to the to the tail end of your question, uh, the fact that one we we may have access, but it's unequal access. We need to keep an eye out for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to keep an eye out for the fact that it, it it's it's a it's a power question about who can opt in and opt out. There's somebody who must depend, who might find they have to depend on that unsteady diet of bad information to know whether they'll go out on the street and sell their wares. Maybe I can choose to, I'm in a position where I can afford to keep a eagle's view on Kenyan news for whatever reason. That creates a divide amongst us as voters, for example. Mm -hmm. What are the different ways we're being taken apart and how is uh, digital or any technology being used is how we should be thinking about it. And most importantly, with all technologies, it's not the technologies themselves, the, what the determinism, it's not the technology shaping the outcome, is the technology being used in the society's ways of doing things. So we need to de dethrone this notion that tech is what does it, because then that creates a, a convenient blame. When the blame is we have such unfinished business of liberation, of unifying, of doing the development work that we're supposed to do, uh, of going from recommendations to action that we need to think about. So uh, <laughs> one, even on, let's just talk about the internet alone for a second. Right now, it's still the people who have like maybe offline brand names like politicians or academics or others who have that influence or journalists for that matter, mm -hmm. who will have the most followership, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and a, a few other people rise to those um, occasions, obviously. What's their responsibility as leaders in that regard? because there's a leadership to that. It's like with, with it's a weird power that comes with responsibility with followership. Yeah, <laughs> with influence and influence. <laughs> Sorry if you didn't choose it, but it comes, it comes with a responsibility, not necessarily even to say something, sometimes to not say something. Mm -hmm. So that transcends the tech even. Right, right. right. The tech gives and the tech takes away. Tomorrow the algorithms could say that most of your followership is bot, bots, like fake followers. And then, you know, your numbers or whatever, or whatever has come to mean your influence goes down. Mm -hmm. These things are still about the interhuman relations we want to have with one another. And I think mm -hmm. we've been so bombarded in Kenya right now with the unhealthy information diet online and offline, we're going to start losing a sense of what even brings us together. 
Wow. Wow. And not that the, you know, that usual, oh, let's sing the national anthem no, no. by a moment. Oh. Yeah. Um, in a, we are, because of how we've been, we're just so all over the place, understandably so. We are running um, a great risk of never having anything that brings us together to even do more than just a moment's notice of work. Mm -hmm. And with our election cycles, we have we are at risk of never voting anyone in. We are always wait, going to be voting people out mm -hmm. if we're not careful. So we will never have a plan. We will never say, okay, we are from this area and ask guys, we want to focus on this thing that started with schools. Schools was a project 10 years ago. Where have we reached the progress on the issues that should uh, bypass the politics? The fact that with a pandemic, schools closed, doctors, teachers, you name it, that none of that has been the defining political conversation. It's been about a referendum, uh, who's for or against this, it really tells you how far gone we are. So tech is just serving that, that agenda. It's not what has created the agenda. Mm -hmm. So if it's going to be thrown up as a problem, uh, we should be able to at least vigilantly say, no, actually, this goes back to the undercurrents in our society that have never really gotten the moment to be fixed. But at the same time, I always like to make sure I also put this in that we can still use these technologies for good, but that is, that is tied to the intrinsic motivation. You look at how creative the internet space is, for example, just amongst Kenyans or Africans, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to see. Mm. Why can't that then be what we use as a baseline to then do some stuff? So this comes down to political in, and intrinsic motivation over and above the technologies of the day. Radio had its moment. Newspapers had their moment. We are seeing all these things come into this platform that is virtual. What are we mm. going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? Mm -hmm. I mean, speaking, speaking of... Uh... Uh, intrinsic human connections. I mean, that, 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 I mean, well put as you've said, in talking about how the undercurrent of the, the political uh, political architecture is very is very uh, abrasive, violent. I mean, uh, as you're rightly saying, and that technology is just uh, augmenting these realities. I think it brings me now to the next question around statehood, and 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 and, and, I, and I like what uh, Nanjala. Uh, uh, a digital democracy, how she called it, digital democracy in her book. So then, how how does how does how how do you see uh, the digital citizen? You know, uh, the digital citizen uh, beginning to 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 find a space for, I mean, to find agency, but find a space for 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 to create popular energy to to galvanize th themselves. You know, around particular identities that are one are, are positive but two are not are not in constant movement or they can't they can't coalesce towards a particular thing how is this tension playing out within the digital space because as you rightly say there is i mean the political class is is, is very uh, is very is very is very good at uh, divisive politics you know and and keeping the populace from one issue to, to the next you know referendum what you're seeing right now referendum elections etc you know this person, that person, but then how then do, how, do, how does a digital citizen uh, begin to have a particular, begin to occupy a certain space such that they were to, to really, to really start being to define their kind of democracy? To me, a Kenyan, a Kenyan particularly digital citizen is not necessarily representative of the voter or the right population of the, of the country, right? The dynamics, mm, right. but there are four to be reckoned with. For a couple true. of weeks. One, you know, the classic over the years argument has been, oh yeah, digital is just armchair activists and blah, blah, blah. Mm. But everybody from media, uh, media personalities and eventually politicians, they came to that space. They entered those spaces. So it means right. something there matters. So the, the, the art stick should not be a false notion that because the people, a digital citizen, or the person whose day-to-day activities involves being online um, and sharing their views and all that, um, just because they're not necessarily the mwananchi, uh, mm -hmm. the way we love to say it, does not mean they're not, they don't matter because they might be very influential because the typical dynamic is they're probably going to be here in, in an urban area. They're going to have some cloud, based in a familiar setting, maybe you're supporting 
uh, a big chunk of folks back in a rural area or in a less urban area. Uh, so you have an influence. I mean, like basically they're an influential dynamic in whatever demographic they fit within. Mm-hmm. So because these people have also come there, let's not forget there's a power there. Over the years, what's been really, really interesting to see about Kenya uh, is there's the, 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 the digital citizen, if we're going to call them that, is somebody who's really been flexing what it means to have their rights, their democratic rights. It may not always be continuous, like they may not be holding the same agenda they did five years ago, mm-hmm. but they're doing it. And, you know, it manifests presently in the most interesting ways, just the reactions. I love reading comment sections right. when a politician posts <laughs> or there's a news item about um, the politics, right? right? The comment section tell you a lot. They're the most rich, uh, insightful sense of who's getting their voice and it's even if you're shouting into a, vo- a vortex, right? That the, the kinds of expressions, there have been very interesting indicators of how people feel about this. So that even if we're not getting their views represented in the same platform that is getting these politicians' um, stuff shared, mm-hmm. those reactions are very important to see. And over the years in Kenya, that's been a very important role that the internet has played for the digital citizen. Right. And it's, it takes another very interesting subversive uh, element, which is humor. We yes. have mastered, I sometimes say like Kenyans online are just one big digital creative agency. Mm. Uh, and so that has become, that has stayed over the years, over the last 10 or so years I've been studying this. In Kenya, humor has been a huge moment. It's subversive, mm-hmm. it is cathartic, but it also starts to bring us together in ways that may not make sense now, but I think it's really giving a lot more people a sense of where I'm not alone in thinking this, you mm-hmm. know, or a sense of creating not an us versus them, but there's more of us on this side who are not benefiting from this false, you know, picture that has been mm-hmm. painted. Mm-hmm. And those are undercurrents we one must not we must stop undermining by saying, you know, those are just people, armchair activists. Mm-hmm. Over the years, I wrote a lot about why that argument was not going to help us form new political formations Mm -hmm. because if we keep shutting down just because you're thinking ah those are just urban people or these people that it misses the point that there's a moment they're being created right there's been another element to it the learning and unlearning that i feel the kenyan digital citizen has been exposed to Mm -hmm. and particularly for the more open platforms like facebook and twitter Mm -hmm. that has that has been quite important it's been quite important in the sense that you'll see something from people just doing threads on alternative history. So everyone from journalists like John Kamau of The Nation to uh, you know folks who are interested in history or just history buffs sharing the story, the alternative story that was not in your textbook kind of thing, mm-hmm. bringing us together. So we're having these digital barazas that way, mm-hmm. where we sit in the digital campfire and we start re- hair recounting. And then somebody else says, in fact, that day their grandparent has told them because they lived through that 1952 moment, this is what happened in their corner of the world then we're building again our history in a way that was not in the official narrative. That is really important present continuous work. It may not be finished today or tomorrow. We're not going to all just have one big creative book that we put together, Absolutely. but there it is. That's how we are doing it. So having some, extending some grace and empathy and especially for those who are pundits and comment, commentators on this is so important. It's not going to happen overnight. 50 years of, uh, of 55 or whatever, how many years we've been doing this is, yes, there's a lot, there's a lot that has shaped up as norms, but every moment, every wave, whether it's technological or otherwise, is giving us an opportunity to revisit and create a continuum. So extending grace to that is quite important and looking out and keeping that eye on a bigger picture is so important because I think if a lot more people who have a lot more influence do that, we could start getting the right strategies to use the tools in different settings to recalibrate what the bigger conversation should be right. in our country today. Mm. Oh, wow. So if we can if we can focus on that, if we can find a few more people, especially mm. those with that kind of influence to focus on that. Mm. That would really create a new inf- you know, influential standpoint, whether or not this other stuff continues, uh, we'll start seeing what people see as a sideshow and what is actually real. So there are opportunities, and here's how we can creatively even use these technologies to that end. Mm. Oh. I mean, speak, speak, speaking of bigger stories and bigger narratives, uh, uh, couple, 
two, three years ago, uh, the historian and philosopher Yuval Harari Noah wrote a book, 21st, 21 questions of the 21st century. And one of the questions that he highlights is uh, the space for, particularly for uh, what we've been calling developing nations and third world nations, is that in this new uh, platform society, uh, uh, this, this, this countries, countries like Kenya, could we fall under that category, risk, risk, risk being a useless class, you know, like we may not, you know, risk being a, a useless class, we may not have any value to, to global humanity. I mean, of course, I, I, I mean, of course, uh, this, this argument uh, should be teared down by many ways. But one of the key things that he says is that uh, because of the, because of just the augmented reality automation uh, in, increasingly within those spaces, you know, uh, so, some countries may, may, may fall out, we're not able to catch up, you know, like we were revolution, we're able to catch up. Uh, so, I mean, if, well, this is true or false, whether this argument is true or false, I think that my question is that what do we need to do as, particularly not just Kenya, but even as uh, African nation, to not miss out this wave, to not miss out this, in a sense, this new space or how society is evolving to start to become a key player. What are some of the, the key things that we need to do uh, policy-wise, I mean, since I know you're in that space, but even just as, as the, the common one and you know, things to do so we're able to move into this space in terms of able to uh, benefit of knowledge of technology as it is, but even of the, 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 the advantages that it brings to us. What are some of the key things in your view that we need to do? We need <laughs> to, uh, to read less of people like Harari. In my <laughs> I like that. Like, leadership industry short circuits how we think broadly and see this. Absolutely. I mean, uh, first question I'd get off asking him, who told that the notion of uselessness and invisibility that is building on the same tropes of racism and sexism that Absolutely. The rest of that world we have today. Mm. We're not going to be invisible or useless because of a couple of even practical things like most minerals that are building devices are coming from these parts of the world. Right. Most labor that is automating um, data, data sets and uh, feed, you know, all of that mm -hmm. is humans, human labor from Africa, from um, Asia and all that. Just because we're on the, in, in, an, in a false setting when the bottom end does not mean we're invisible or useless. Right. We're also the ones with the most creative users for these technologies. They are fashioned in a very limited <laughs> Western urban white male view then we come out here and we stretch them in varieties. And then our, our ways of doing this are not even being accommodated. So it's already a, a bad bargain. So, uh, and, and I'd extend then to say, is that really even what we want for ourselves? Right. We've seen what's possible, but is it what's right for us? So it absolutely goes back to other conversations and unfinished ones around development, the kind of development where we got urbanization as this, or westernization mm -hmm. as progress. Yes. progress. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. You know? yeah. We have more mm -hmm. malls and then libraries, we're forgetting green spaces. And then somebody will come back and tell you ecologizing the way your grandmother used to teach you to build mud huts, though it was backward then, is now ecologizing and you do you pay a premium. We we I think it's a shield member who says, you know, we have to rehabilitate our right to think, think for ourselves and thinking as a human being based on the environment we're in. This notion right. that what that happens over there is what must happen for us. Mm -hmm. keeps us on this catch up keep, and it's, you know, it actually even creates Absolutely. this inferiority complex right. that it, we are struggling with. So that it's not even about writing a policy to make sure we have a, like something as like GDPR, mm -hmm. right? It's about how do we even think about stuff like data collection? One of the things that has been very interesting on in my years as a researcher is taking a big step back from primary research. Because if I go to a community today, based on my upbringing and understanding of how people are, you should create cycles that are actually mutually reinforcing. That extractive nature of doing research where you go get data, maybe you pay a stipend uh, or to people and all that. You know, it's created and situational because we're so over research too in the development tropes, especially Kenya as right. a donor darling. Yeah. The areas you can put in there, like they have their price, right? So first, even before you talk about <laughs> what you're researching, this is the price point, I can get you. Like you have the, or the person who does you um, set, can put up your sample size. It's just a hustler. Mm. So that intelligence is just something else, man. Um, Manufacturers. So I've ventured more to looking, yeah. I've ventured more into reading through what is happening and just being a, 
as as ethical an observer as possible and not just remixing a la Harari style and calling right. a whole people useless, but mm. creating general frames to ask more questions and complicate the questions. Absolutely. But we have the intellectual, we have the technical, we have the mo uh, well, moral, not so much, but we have the technical, intellectual, what you name it, capacity, whether it's in Kenya, whether it's at Africa, whether it's as what has been called a third world or otherwise, to absolutely change the game. Right. Because what is also happening, that Western archive, the Western way of doing things is disintegrating, as we've seen. Absolutely. Mm, so that right now we're going to have the politics of the vaccine that follow an age old politics after all these years of saying how we're equals. We're back to where we're being shown we're not equals. Mm. The question becomes, how do we organize ourselves here to call BS and push back? Because we can. Mm. We absolutely can change. The question is whether there's that fortitude across the board to sustain that. And that's what's going to determine really what happens in this particular interesting decade where so many disruptions are coming together, mm, but also moment. so many tools that can make things better. Right. So, I mean, so ha, my final question, uh, Nanjiri, before I let you go, is that then what's, I, I don't know, the Western canon always points there, the one big philosophical question, but who, what, 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 are, what are the philosophical questions that, that this conversation of tech has really raised and that we need, we as Africans need to start, uh, need to start talking to ourselves, but also answering. What are the philosophical questions that are in your view that this, this has really brought to the fore? One, why an urban white male wearing a hoodie <laughs> becomes a god who <laughs> determines how a platform works or right. how the world works mm -hmm. is scary. We are living in a paradigm right now across the globe with tech where that man I've just described, it's right. usually a man, uh, <laughs> has more power mm -hmm. financially uh, um, and any, any other formation of power really mm -hmm. to determine right now who will get to communicate with whom, mm -hmm. who gets to see an important news item, how a community somewhere will have access to something or not. We have created new gods that we cannot govern and now governments across, including where they're from, don't know how to take them down a peg. The paradigm is shifting where our digital futures and present is in the hands of private actors and not such an accountable private actors to us. Mm -hmm. And here I go back again to the example of Uganda, mm -hmm. where for all the other dynamics that were happening, that particular drop into that dynamic of a, of a company that is not registered in, in that Uganda country is controlling and did, not, and did not even like whether it's a notice or have the same conversation they did about over time whether the, the platform of president trump the same treatment was not given to another country because for them whatever reason they may imagine that is a very big problem so that it's quite interesting when it has to come from the mouth of the person who was going to shut down the internet anyway mm -hmm. but they're not they're not wrong in asking that question Mm. They're not wrong. I believe that um, the internet is back on in Uganda, but Facebook remains shut. Mm -hmm. So that creates an interesting question about a platform that is on one hand very popular and people of Uganda use to communicate with one another right. is off um, limits for them right now. But at the same time, if it, even if you were to come back on and it's somebody else so far away, they would never vote for this person. Uh, but this person can determine when and you know uh, they see something or not. That whole paradigm has changed. So even how institutions, uh, estates, government, uh, private sector, uh, civil society have existed, those paradigms have been shifting quite interestingly right. in the digital age, right. just because of how much was let slip. And these questions I'm saying, the big picture questions mm -hmm. were sort of not carried forth. Mm -hmm. And tech has been used to intimidate people. It's too often you hear, People say, oh, you're, you know, I'm not a techie, da, da, da. and I'm like, tech for me has never been about necessarily knowing how blockchain will meet AI and create some climate crypto future, whatever. Mm. Those are just, that's just one layer. It's really about these bigger questions around how that intersects with the co context of society, um, that intelligence around the way a world around certain people works. And how mm -hmm. then that technology either comes from that community in terms of how it's created or how it will go out to the world. 
Right. So if we can get a lot more people making that the case and the narrative about tech and society, we'll realize that maybe we should have been having, and especially for us, because we'll still be put in development, right? So we have right. digital development. That we could change the game absolutely completely and say, well, you want to develop, it's not just build it and then we'll come. Here's how we want it built. And this is how we'd like to have it. Mm -hmm. um, as a closing sort of like narrative, just to show you how this thing goes south is Project Loon after mm -hmm. Fanfare, I mean, the president did, <laughs> came and gave us a press release. No, the press statement, my apologies. He mm. actually came on TV, told us they've partnered with Google to bring mm. us balloon internet. <laughs> balloon internet is going away. Was it what we needed? Absolutely not. Mm. It was just hype. It was just a hype. Like the questions around how it worked, who it was working for, it did not address questions of whether they made the internet more affordable. It may have marginally made internet more available in terms of coverage area, but it still needed somebody who was a local actor to have been building the infrastructure. Right. So those are the layers right. and the explainability we need to start bringing into the mainstream discussion about technology in the day-to-day -day news. Um, breaking down, and I, I always make this point, ask those questions, ask those basic questions, however silly they sound. They're the mm -hmm. most important ones because if somebody cannot explain to you why that balloon is the one that will change and make sure you can work from home or not. And they just want to throw fancy terminology at you. They're probably the ones more ignorant than you are. Mm. <laughs> so getting that paradigm shifting, I always say, ask what, why, like be that six year old, what, why, how come? And then those basic questions need to, we need, a, whether you're a journalist, whether you're just an ordinary user, whether you're a politician, we need to have a lot more people asking those questions. So we can separate the, the hope from the hype um, and actually then build on the hope because there is hope. There absolutely right. is hope. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, Hannah Arendt who used to say, you know, have such love to believe uh, for the world to believe that change is possible. Mm -hmm. I think we can still, and there's still the, the embers are there to make sure there's a love for the world, our love for our country, um, or of our community to believe that change is possible and to emanate a new kind of change. Okay, Nanjiro Sambuli, that, that, thanks for that. That's a really wonderful ending. Thanks for, for this wonderful interview. Thank you for having me, Joe. Thank you so much.